Now, the kaleidoscope feature. Next week, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula goes on release. As our cinema screens are awash once again with the blood of the vampire's victims, Mark Berman takes a look at the history of the vampire on film. Norm was brought up with a kind of Dracula image. I knew about it long before. It, it's something that comes out of history, you know, you're coming from mountains and the mountains there is the sort of the forest and out of the forest where there is a strange castle you don't know what's going on behind those doors i am dracula and i welcome you to my house i must apologize for not being here to greet you personally but i trust that you have found everything you needed he can appear as mist as vapor as the fog and he can vanish at will Master, you're Dracula, son of Dracula. You've been the reigning prince of darkness for over 700 glorious years. If you wish to see the destruction of the horror spawned by Count Dracula, come with me. But I warn you, it is not a sight for the squeamish. On and on they come, those vampire hordes. Dead white skin, fangs bared, a mouth that never closes. Long to reign over them and our imaginations is their vampire king, Dracula from Bram Stoker's original novel through to stage, film and beyond. Now, Dracula is as likely to come in the form of a blood-red ice lolly as a screen demon. This year, we'll see a cinematic feeding frenzy, with at least 11 vampire films looming out of the dark. Leading the pack is, of course, the Count's latest cinematic incarnation, Bram Stoker's Dracula, no less. So what is it about the Dracula myth that's proved so powerful to filmmakers? Director Francis Ford Coppola. I believe that Dracula and, and, and such gothic stories come from the fact that as human beings, our feelings and our intuitions and our emotional makeup seems to know more than our minds do, that there are more mystical elements that we don't know. And for that reason, it's extremely satisfying and, and perhaps comforting to read fairy tales on fantasies because they address that subterranean knowledge that we, we all really have. And uh, Dracula capitalized on that. And you could just see those girls in the Victorian time, you know, in their buttoned up night shirts, you know, with youthful feelings and, and blood and hormone in them reading this kind of stuff. It must be very titillating. It's not that it means one thing. It's that it can mean almost anything. There are so many different interpretations of, of the vampire story. There's a sexual interpretation, there's a political interpretation, there are social readings of it, there are psychological readings of it. Uh, you can play it for comedy, you can play it for horror, you can play it for excitement. There's a kind of wistful, dreamy romanticism, there's a kind of really rather vicious, hardcore pornography. All these approaches are legitimate with the vampire story. I just think it's really rich. I think it's a very haunting mythology, especially today, the notion of immortality, you know, and I think it's something that's very seductive to a human being who feels so small, you know, on, on the planet, and so microscopic in relation to the environment. So I think, you know, I think it's very haunting. I think it's a way to escape your, you know, your kind of destiny is to explore those kinds of mythologies. Critic Kim Newman and director Catherine Bigelow Long before Dracula made his way through the night, the vampire tapestry was being woven in nearly every culture. Blood for sacrifice, blood for healing, progressing inexorably from primitive myths to elegant salon literature. These early literary tales and the real histories of figures like Vlad the Impaler undoubtedly influenced one Abraham Stoker, by day business manager of Henry Irving's Lyceum Theatre, by night an unlikely teller of tales, Professor Christopher Frayling. Stoker was an ex-civil servant from Dublin whose first book was called The Duties of Clerks of the Petty Sessions in Ireland, not, uh, I would have thought, particularly filmable or much of a bestseller. And it's one of the great mysteries how this rather genial, uh, practical joking Irishman ends up writing one of the most potent horror stories of all time. And I argue that, from some evidence, that it was a nightmare that started it, because the whole book has a kind of logic of a dream. I was not alone. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, Ladies by their dress and manner, 
there was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing, and at the same time, some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they'd kiss me with those red lips. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. And then in comes Dracula, the big boss man, and says, this man belongs to me. My God, you know, the dream suddenly gets extremely complicated at this point, where having been a fairly straightforward kind of erotic fantasy, here comes the boss man saying, this man belongs to me. I've reserved him for me. So there's a, there's a kind of homosexual fantasy coming through as well. And to a very straight-laced late Victorian like Stoker, this must have blown his head off. The result was a lurid story shot full of Victorian repression and revulsion. Heroic estate agent Jonathan Harker journeys to Dracula's Transylvanian keep and literally provides the keys for this beast from the east to invade England and ravage its women, Harker's wife included. Stoker's count comes complete with bad breath, hairy palms and swarthy complexion. Unlocking libidos as he goes, Dracula must be staked by the good hand of Van Helsing and his fearless band of vampire hunters. Full of endless paragraphs of purple prose, it didn't matter if Stoker wasn't the world's greatest author. With Dracula, he boiled down all the vampire myths and stories into a primal primer. Come out, Sir Lenny. She's a vampire! I don't understand. It's a very synthetic myth. It's got all sorts of things it picks up on from other aspects of folklore. A stake through the heart is the way of dispatching the vampire. That came from suicides, who were sort of nailed down so they didn't come back. Drinking the blood of the slain warrior, a kind of anthropological thing that you get in pre-literate societies. It, it hooks into that. The decadent aristocrat, the gothic novel, the sort of clanking chains of ghost stories. of Victoria. And it, it's a great synthesis of all these. And Stoker synthesized it all and invented some new rules of his own, and did them in such a kind of po-faced way that people thought they'd existed from time immemorial. Never out of print since its publication in 1897, Dracula began his progress to the screen with slow, faltering steps. Treading the boards and donning an evening suit in a progress, the Count began to lose some of his bite. Author David Scow. It was only in the theatre when, when Dracula was adapted to the stage in the 1920s that the character began to undergo a, a sea change, as it were. Uh, in order to work in the theater and observe the conventions of a drawing room mystery melodrama, Dracula had to be turned into the kind of character who you would plausibly invite into your drawing room to begin with, and that wasn't the character that Bram Stoker envisioned at all. Uh, his Dracula's idea of a social call was to you know, smash through your bedroom window in the form of a wolf. And so the, we got the evening clothes and the impeccable manners and the, the oily Transylvanian charm, all of which Stoker never dreamed of. And it is the shadow of that stage version of Dracula that has really haunted and distorted the image of Dracula and all the subsequent adaptations. It seems that the story of Dracula, whenever it's being retold, is retold for other values, for the morality of good and evil, the romance, the excitement, Victorian adventure, whatever. Only F.W. Murnau went out and created a vampire who was disgusting and frightening and horrible. Nosferatu, conjured up by German director F.W. Murnau in 1922, is an expressionist frightmare freely adapted from Stoker's book. It added a vital piece of lore to the legend, making sunlight fatal to the vampire. And what a vampire! Never have the undead looked so... Well, undead! Actor Max Schreck walks with a stiff gait, elongated claws by his side, ghastly sunken eyes stare out of a bald skull, two rat-like teeth protruding from hungry lips. It was intended to be a sort of symbol or metaphor for the aftermath of, of World War I, which had really destroyed and, and decimated the, the country and the economy. In the publicity materials for the film, the vampire was likened to warfare and its aftermath as this, uh, this kind of cosmic war was a cosmic vampire, you know, that drained the blood of millions and millions of people. 
Despite Nosferatu's brilliance, it took another decade before Hollywood finally came calling on the Count. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. I like to think of that film as maybe the most influential bad movie Hollywood has ever made because it really unleashed this whole dormant impulse toward the fantastic in the American cinema. And of course, fantastic and imaginative films have become among the most influential and profitable in Hollywood. And it all started with, with Dracula back in 1931. I have chartered a ship to take us to England. We will be leaving Tomorrow evening. He couldn't really speak English. He had to learn it phonetically, it's passed phonetically. David Pirry, author of The Vampire Cinema. That was why he appeared so strange in the films. There's something of the thug about Lugosi. This gives it a very peculiar, particular resonance, which you do remember. It isn't Dracula exactly, but it's odd and slightly savage and slightly creepy. I am Dracula. I bid you welcome. Soy Dracula. Los muros de mi castillo están cuarteado. Bela Lugosi wasn't the only one creeping around the cobwebbed sets of Universal Studios. In the dead of night, something stirred. A rival Spanish version engaged in a game of one-upmanship with director Todd Browning. The making of the Spanish Dracula must have been a very peculiar experience. It was filmed at night. The actors came in after the American crew had left, and they started about 6 o'clock and uh, stopped for dinner at midnight and continued right on till morning. The director of the Spanish film, a man named George Melford, knew no Spanish, and he had to direct the actors with the aid of an interpreter. And he obviously didn't care much for what Todd Browning was doing with the Lugosi film, and so the crew would watch the brushes every day, and they would top it. <laughs> you say so? <laughs> For the then 17-year-old Lupita Tovar, Dracula's Spanish love, the alternate night world of six decades ago has never been forgotten. It was a very eerie film, and working at night in a dark set with candles and all that, it, it was for me kind of scary, you know, but very, very exciting. And we were trying to do as good as the English film, if not better, you know. <laughs> they concentrated, the studio concentrated on the American version that was Bela Lugosi and Helen Chandler. So they were concentrated on the American market. It didn't get the publicity that should have gotten worldwide, you know. And uh, 60, 61 years later, now they decided now that the Spanish version is better than the than the English, you know. <laughs> oh, your very eyes is all that remains of a vampire, one of the world's undead. Although Dracula marked the beginning of Universal Studios' immensely profitable horror cycle, it also meant the end of Bela Lugosi's career outside of the Count's cloak. Astonishingly, he only played the role twice on screen, but audiences never forgot him in the part. By the time he was stalking the likes of Abbott and Costello in 1948, both Dracula and the vampire needed fresh blood. Now bear in mind, Mr. Kent, this woman is not your sister-in-law. She's dead. This is the shell, and what it contains is pure evil. When we destroy it, we destroy only the evil. But there's just one more thing, Mr. Harker. I have to go out, and I will not be back until after sundown tomorrow. But until then... Please look upon this house as your own. I know what you're after. What? You're training to be a vampire. <laughs> You've been listening to village gossip. They are not suitable for girls of an impressionable age. Well, no, I suppose not. A bit uh, frightening. Perhaps.
there was an attempt to kind of restrain the sexuality that had been unleashed in the 40s. It didn't work. And they didn't, the way it didn't work was you've got a lot of things erupting. You had pornography sort of distributed for the first time quite widely. You also had comic books and rock and roll and all of that stuff. And you had Hammer movies. Because by going back to the 19th century, Hammer were able to put sexuality on the screen that the Americans simply wouldn't have dared to do. David Perry. From 1958 onwards, the tall and menacing presence of Christopher Lee turned Dracula into box office magic for Hammer in film after film. No matter how he died at the end, with Peter Cushing's Van Helsing driving home the stake, the next film would have to ingeniously resurrect him. Although its first films were under the direction of old hands like Terence Fisher, the House of Hammer quickly became a breeding ground for young talent, including Hungarian director Peter Sazdi, who with Taste the Blood of Dracula rang a few changes out of a tried and tested formula. We were part of an atmosphere here, we wanted to be a bit different, a bit more free, and you were complaining about the older generation, you were complaining about the hypocrisy. You said, come on. Let's be brave, face what's in front of us, and, and look into the mirror. You and your two friends here have formed a little society with the objects of enjoying the more unusual aspects of, of this life. Is that right? That is quite right. At the same time, keeping up a facade of respectability in front of your families and local community. Is that right? Well, I'd hardly... Certainly after the Terence Fisher films, Taste of the Blood of Dracula is the best of the Hammer films, it still has the Hammer problem of having to star actresses who seem to come from the producer's girlfriend school of dramatic art. It's one of the, the few Hammer films that has any sense of class as part of, of period. I think it's a very late 60s film. Uh, it, it's very much never trust anybody over 30. Father, I love him. I know it was wrong of me. Yes. It was wrong of you. I'm sorry, Father. And you're going to be punished for it. Father, I said I'm sorry. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to whip you. Don't touch me. I think there were two key images from the Hammer Cycle, and I, they go together. They have to go together. You can't really have one without the other. On one side, you have lush pastoral exteriors with castles and forests, coaches, horses, rather gloomy, very English, kind of sense of uh, menace, perhaps, weather. And on the other, you have the interiors, the bedroom interiors, and you have blood and you have gore. Now, the two go together. If you have one without the other, it isn't exactly hammer. I think you need both. In other words, the two things really are sex and nature in a funny kind of way, or sex and castles. Go down to the river tonight for a moonlight swim. Then you'll feel much better. But Miss Blaze, I will be around. That's easy. We'll put a couple of pillows in the bed. She'll think we're asleep. Yes. We'll go at midnight. In fact, it wasn't only Hammer who indulged in sex and castles. By the early 70s, Dracula's capering was all but eclipsed by full frontal nudity, as softcore sex replaced metaphors with midriffs. For now, it was Women Biting Women, filmed, of course, by men. Filmmaker and author Andrea Weiss. The lesbian vampire is a figure who, who has an active, aggressive sexuality. That's something that women are never permitted in the cinema. Won't even deal with real life, but in the cinema. And uh, here, this is a figure who has this, and in a way that could be seen as a great leap forward because uh, it's a breakthrough in terms of what was allowed for uh, female characters in film. But in the same way, it's expressed in a kind of pathological relationship, and of course, it ends in the character's destruction, almost always. So she's given that freedom, but then she pays a heavy price for it. Like a stake through Hammer's heart, changing audience tastes spelled its doom. How could Dracula's dog compete with the explicit likes of Spermula? And having tried everything that your narrow imaginations can suggest, you're bored to death with it all, right? Despite three different versions of Dracula, all in 1979, vampires kept their tongues planted firmly in their cheeks, essential for survival in the self-referential 80s. You did the right thing by calling us. Does your brother sleep a lot? Yeah, all day. Does the sunlight freak him out? Uh, he wears sunglasses in the house. Yeah, his fingernails are all a bit longer. Um, he always had bad breath, though. 
most 80s and, and early 90s vampire stories have been essentially comic uh, in the cinema. Things like The Lost Boys or Fright Night or Once Bitten or I Married a Vampire, My Best Friend is a Vampire, Beverly Hills Vamp. The titles themselves explain the kind of approach the story they have. A movie like Fright Night, which is, I suspect, the most commercially successful vampire film of all time, feels a desperate need to distance itself from it. It's, it's about a kid who is trying to persuade people that the, the tall, dark stranger next door really is a vampire. Mom, I'm not sick! The guy did have fangs, and a bat did fly over my head, and a second later, he stepped out of the shadows. Now, don't you see what that means? Wait, let me guess. What? He's a vampire. A what? A what? A vampire. Damn it, haven't you listened to anything I've said? I think you can still make scary vampire pictures, but it's almost like we've gone beyond that. Just being frightened of, of, of them is no longer enough. And so we tend to have films like Near Dark, for instance, a, a, I think a very interesting picture. But it's from the point of view of the vampires. What you people want? Just a couple more minutes of your time, about the same duration as the rest of your life. Ah! I hate him when they ain't been shaved. More than any other film of the 80s, Near Dark breathed genuine life into the undead, its po-white trash bloodsuckers driving through the night in a camper van with tinfoil and black aerosols to ward off the morning sun. In place of impeccable manners, a silver spur to open their victims' throats. Director Catherine Bigelow. What we wanted to do was modernize, update the vampire mythology and eliminate all the gothic trappings, um, get away from all the crosses, the fangs, stakes through the heart, silver bullets, etc. And really think of them almost like night creatures, people of the night who happen to be immortal, who are not psychopathic killers. They're kind of like anarchists. You know, they kind of live outside the system, just like the, the cowboys did in the West. I mean, they're mavericks. They're contemporary cowboys. Hey, Caleb! I hate to be an Indian giver. I really do. But you disappointed me. Now you're going to have to pay. First, you're going to give me back my spur. What do you think of them apples, huh? The cowboy might seem an odd guise for the vampire, but then it's always been a sexual outlaw, whether in a string tie or a fluttering cape. The vampire is the original serial killer, a perfect figure to be rediscovered for the 90s. Producer Simon Johnson, whose tale of a vampire is amongst the current burst of bloodletting. People are very interested in evil at the moment. Silence of the Lambs last year, the hero of that was almost Hannibal the Cannibal. This is another film with somebody who is definitely not good as the hero. The idea of not good v bad, but you don't know who is right and who is wrong. Uh, and, and you end up often cheering for someone who does diabolical deeds. <laughs> Bram Stoker's Dracula, the very title promising authenticity, is a big, fat, sumptuous horror event movie. It has stars and a star director in Francis Ford Coppola. It also has a tact on prologue, turning the real 16th century of Vlandi Impaler into the tragic hero of Coppola's movie. Its Dracula may be more faithful than Bela Lugosi's portrayal, but Stoker's sex beast has become one from the heart. Being that this was supposed to be like a kind of love story amalgamum with a monster picture, we did have plenty of scenes where he's shown as a mucousy beast and sucking blood and doing that so we felt we had delivered on the kind of reptilian dracula and we weren't sure at you know whether or not people would uh, feel sympathy for him or or be able to tolerate this love and in fact the opposite had happened i mean women were saying yeah i hope he doesn't die at the end oh my god who are you i know you 
Is, uh, is like a kind of moving symbolist painting, a uh, erotic dream. It's meant to be very rich in imagery and, and constantly unfolding as it might if you were thinking about it late at night and were half asleep. One of the beauties of the horror film is that it's extremely lenient in allowing you style. I had this idea that if you were in the presence of the undead, that the laws of physics were not the same. Liquids would drip upwards and and uh, shadows would move on their own, and that, but that ultimately these would be little details. You know, I'd be talking to you and enjoying talking to you, and all of a sudden I'd notice something weird about your hair doing something that normal people don't do, and then I would realize, my God, he's a vampire. And, and that was the principle that I was exploring. Perhaps more than any other, this Dracula is full of eroticism and fearful desire. The Count rats in wolf form in a midnight graveyard. The film's sexual politics mingle 1890s repression with 1990s regression. Here, Dracula's vampire brides become the ultimate fatal females feeding on male terror. <laughs> I had this idea that these would be like a succubus, that you'd be in there and that you would sense them without seeing them and you would see their footsteps and you would hear the bells that were on their beautiful ankles uh, and you would be sucked into an erotic state and then there they would be. And Harker's pretty impotent most of the way through. I mean, in fact, he gets bitten in a very vital place in that. Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of people scene. don't notice it, but we really did. I mean, like in that, if you look, she looks at his um, bulge in his pants and she smiles and she does a big chop and he says, ah, you know. One of the great themes of modern time is the impotence of men. It's a real thing. The devil's concubine! Hey, hey. You understand me? A horn of darkness! <laughs> well, you're a sick old buzzard! <laughs> Each new generation demands its Dracula needs its vampire metaphors of sex and death. The original novel is rife with allusion to the ravages of syphilis. Surely it's no coincidence, then, that our own fears of sexual disease come wafting through the recycled nightmares of the past. In the Age of AIDS, the vampire does everything we are not permitted to do. The vampire exposes himself freely to blood. The vampire... Uh, is promiscuous and often bisexual, and in an age of immune dysfunction, the vampire is immune to everything, including death itself. Maybe it's kind of comforting. It may be a way of bargaining with death. <laughs> uh, I would have said, if you'd asked me this in 1980, that the whole field was completely played out, that there was nothing possible you could do with it, and I would have been wrong. Now I suspect that a hundred years have gone by, it's official, you know, this is one of the great stories of all time, and it will keep being retold as long as there are stories. My revenge has spread over centuries, and has just begun! The Kaleidoscope feature was presented by Mark Berman. The reader was Philip Anthony, and the program was produced by Sarah Johnson.